As you can see up on screen, uh, we're reading from 2 Kings today, chapter 22. So I'll give you a moment uh, to turn to that if you want to get it up in your Bibles or on your phones. 2 Kings chapter 22, and we're starting from verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jediah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrust it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted to them, because they are honest in their dealings. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have, have entrusted it to the workers and the supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, his, he tore his robes. He gave orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Rakbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Good morning, friends. My name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here of Renew. It's really just a delight to be back with you again. I had a week off uh, last week uh, down the coast, which was, it was, uh, it was, um, tough. Um, but it's, uh, I'm just so pleased to be back with you. Um, uh, we have a bookstall at church and I just want to put a couple of books under your nose, uh, I guess as much as anything for last minute Christmas shopping uh, and those sorts of things. Um, this is um, the kids Bible that uh, we use in our family at the moment. Well, every uh, Bible stories every child should know, and it just goes through a whole bunch of them. Has little questions at the end of each story is about a double page spread, and has questions at the end of them. Um, and uh, we have four kids: uh, oldest is eight, youngest is one. It's chaos, right? It's it's just chaos uh, doing uh, uh, Bible kids time. So it's like five minutes, and that's what we can manage at dinner time. I think it's uh, so I strongly recommend that one. Um, uh, this book is called Is This It by Rachel Jones. Uh, it's a cracker for you if you um, uh, have grown up having certain expectations about how your life was going to go and then you get you get to a point uh, maybe in your you know your, your late 20s, early 30s um, or, or later on uh, where you go, oh, I've, I am... Um, I feel like this should be different. I feel like I should feel different. I feel, I feel like I was told when I was a teenager that life would be different to this. Um, uh, Rachel Jones has written a really helpful book to kind of help you advise uh, those sorts of feelings. Um, I know a number of people at church have read this already and uh, I just really want that one. Uh, the last one I want to tell you about is um, Tim Keller's book, Forgive. Uh, this is the last book he wrote before he died. And um, the, the tagline is, why should I and how can I? Um, and this, Book I'm holding out to you, not so much to give away, but because I know that uh, some of you are going into um, family stuff over Christmas, you're, you're kind of re-entering your family systems um, uh, over Christmas, and you're preparing for things to be a bit difficult. Uh, and you want to know how to process that stuff. Uh, and uh, I think this is a tremendously helpful book. It's not you know, like you get from the uh, title, Forgive, like, if you should forgive kind of thing, but it's not like that at all. It's actually saying, 
you probably want things to be different, don't you? Uh, but it can be really hard to imagine how it could be different. Let me help. Uh, so I just can't recommend that book highly enough. Um, I want to echo as well with, um, I'm just so proud of Renew and the way that we um, served uh, Amy and Alex yesterday. Fully 50 people in, in this room were involved in, in serving in different ways uh, yesterday to make the wedding happen. And um, uh, I just think that is the most lovely, lovely, lovely uh, picture of hospitality uh, that uh, we can offer. Uh, so uh, that's great. Uh, Fred, we're in our second last week of our Origins campaign, and we've been, as as Tom mentioned, we've been tracing through uh, the story of the genealogy of Jesus uh, through the Old Testament. Matthew's biography starts with a list, and if you've not kind of if you're not familiar with uh, how the Bible works or things like that, uh, you might have heard the word begat before and think, oh yeah, there's lots of begats in the Bible, aren't there? Begat, 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 begat. Um, uh, it starts. It starts with a list of of this person um, is the father of this person, and so on and so on. And you go, why is this here? What is this doing here? Like it's such a such a dumb way of starting the the New Testament. But it's there to show you that through the highs and lows of the people of of Israel, God has been very present, and we need something more. Uh, we need something more than what was being offered. Um, so by looking at uh, Jesus' family of origin, um, it's going to help us see our need for Christmas. And that's true today as well, uh, as we look at the life of Josiah. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to um, uh, have a, a look at his story. Gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for going into print and not just showing up, not just having Jesus just arrive one day and expect us to recognize him immediately as the king of all the earth, uh, but that you um, uh, have been active in history, thousands upon thousands of years, setting up the story, setting up our hearts so that we would be prepared to make him room. Um, Father, uh, as we uh, look at this part of your, um, your word to us today, would you please help us to have soft hearts so that we can, um, we can feel the weight of uh, everything that's going on in this story will be transformed by it. And we ask that in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Um, so last week, uh, Patrick uh, introduced us to King Manasseh, um, who was an absolute rotter, wasn't he? If you were here, he was an absolute rotter. Uh, today, we're going to talk about arguably old Israel's greatest king, his best, the best king, uh, King Josiah. Uh, see, where Josiah's granddad uh, Manasseh had been like King Herod uh, in the, the story in Jesus' day. He was willing to sacrifice children to get what he wanted, um, uh, to ensure that he could have what he wanted. Josiah, the boy king, worshipped the Lord. Um, if you've got uh, your phone there or uh, with, uh, you don't own a paper Bible, we've got paper Bibles on the uh, side there, very happy for you to take one of those. We're, we're betting down in this story in 2 Kings 22 that Ingrid read for us before, uh, and we'll, we'll move into 23 as well, so you want to follow along with us. Um, in 2 Kings 22 and verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. So we've got any eight-year-olds in the room? Any eight-year-olds in here? Not today. My daughter is eight. She is not ready to run a country. She thinks she is, but she is not ready to run a country. Um, uh, and worse still, um, the reason he was an eight-year-old boy king uh, was that his father, uh, the officials in his father's court, had him assassinated. Imagine that. You're eight years old. Your dad has just been killed. Long live the king. Think about the trauma and the pressure that Josiah must have been under. This is Game of Thrones stuff, isn't it? Um, he's sitting on a blood-soaked throne, the blood-soaked throne of his dad, and yet, and yet, um, uh, we're told, verse 2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David. That is his great, 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 great father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Now, I want you to understand how incredibly unlikely this is. 
how incredibly unlikely this is. Um, it, it's a straight up miracle. Somehow, somehow the boy king walked with the Lord, even though every everyone around him, all the grown-ups in his life, um, his grand, his parents and his grandparents before him all chased after the false gods of the nations. Josiah walked with the Lord. This is an extraordinary thing. You, you think about it, uh, you're eight. Just imagine this. Think about your eight-year-old self um, and all the grown-ups around you have turned their backs on the Lord. Uh, they've done that thing that people do when they follow the lie of the serpent in the garden. Um, we hear the lie. God is holding out on you. He's not going to give you what you want. He will keep you from being happy. You, you should desire this thing instead. Uh, that is the thing that will give you life. Uh, and when your heart has latched onto that lie, then worship of like Baals or Asherah, Molech, back in his day, um, kind of made sense because they promised such a big game. All gods promise a really big game. Uh, they say, if you worship us just right, if you worship us just right, we'll give you what you want. Inputs equal outputs. Uh, so if you want fertility in your field or in your home, um, then go worship the Baals or the Asherah. Uh, if you want protection and self-determination, go worship Molech. Um, but worshipping the true and living God of Israel was not like that. It didn't work like that. It's, uh, if, if, sorry, um, it required you to trust him. Not to trust that your inputs were just right, but to trust him. Um, to, uh, inputs cannot equal outputs because God is not a genie. Uh, and, and our outputs could never be enough to merit the grace that he's shown us. He is our heavenly father. God is our heavenly father. And like all fathers, sometimes fathers will say yes to the desires of their children's heart. And sometimes they will say no. Well, they're good. You wouldn't believe how much sugar is uh, uh, moving about in the Boxwell household at the moment. It's, uh, it's just insane. And sometimes I say no. For their good. God might even change what we want. And that is, that is wild, right? God doesn't just say no, I'm not going to give you the thing that you really want. Sometimes he changes what we want. Uh, he'll, uh, he's all about reordering our desires so that we would love the right stuff in the right amounts. Now, of course, worshipping uh, those false gods is never going to work. It's never going to work. How, they, they, they cannot give you fertility or protection any more than the statues that represent them can get up and pick up a feather duster and dust themselves off. But because they promise such a big game and they don't deliver, that leaves their worshippers feeling like they have to be ever more precise, ever more uh, fervent in their worship. This is how you get to the point where Manasseh can think to himself, yeah, yeah, sacrificing my son, worth the cost. It's the same for us today. We so prize autonomy that we believe that life is only good and valuable when it works out exactly as we plan it. And so that I have as much control over my life as I possibly can. Um, and when we think like that, we will be willing to kill the very young. And now almost certainly legislation will go through next year in Canberra so that we can start killing our very old or our very sick as well. You know, so they're not a burden. Uh, or perhaps if you worship the God, sorry, if you if you worship a quick buck, you'll invest in crypto or something like that, which is not a currency, incidentally. It's a speculative asset, uh, which means that the only way that you make money is if someone else, some other poor chump, is left holding the thing when it loses all its value. Something to think about. Against all odds, Josiah put his trust in the Lord. He sees that worship all around. He sees that worship all around him, and yet he puts his trust in the Lord. And so, as king, he begins clearing the country of idols. And we say, "Well, that's not very religiously tolerant." It's not very religiously tolerant. One of Josiah's uncles was literally sacrificed to one of these gods. I, I get it. I get why he was doing this. Um, I get why he, he might have thought that this was a good idea. 
as well as clearing the country of idols, at the age of 36, he began a reno on the temple. Um, uh, uh, Ingrid was reading about that before. You can read about it there in, in verses 5 through 7 uh, of chapter uh, 2 Kings 22. Dressed stone, timbers, builders, masons. Uh, he oversaw the lot of it to get the temple back up to scratch. And while this was all going, someone must have been moving some stuff in one of the rooms and thump, something fell on the ground. And they picked it up and they opened it up and they went, oh, oh, I remember what this is. I remember what this is. I have found the book of the Lord, uh, the law in the temple of the Lord. How bad must stuff have been? How bad must stuff have been in Israel, in Jerusalem? That the law of the Lord, the first uh, five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, had been forgotten and lay dormant unread. People go, oh, yeah, what I found. People will sometimes say, oh, things are hard here in Canberra for the gospel. Not that bad. Not that bad. Not so bad that um, he'll fire the high priest. The high priest in the temple discovers that there's a Bible. Hey, what's this? Forgotten for generations. Forgotten for generations. It boggles the mind. No wonder the whole nation strayed into idolatry. No wonder they did. They, they, they didn't have a compelling counter story um, from the God of the Bible. Uh, uh, Shapan, uh, who was one of the king's secretaries, gets uh, given this scroll and he realises it. Uh, he realises this is incredibly important um, and uh, what he's holding in his hand. Um, and so he takes it to the king and he reads it to the king. And I love this. I love this. Um, uh, the guy's a king. And by this stage of the story, he's still, he's still younger than I am uh, now. Uh, imagine all the pressures on this young man's shoulders, um, and yet he still makes time to hear the word of the Lord. I love this. We we make we prioritize what we find beautiful. We we prior, prioritize what we find beautiful. Someone tells us that meditating on the law of the Lord day and night will make us like a tree planted by streams of water. That is, we will be immovable. We will be fruitful and growing. And when you value what the what the the word of the Lord will do in your life, you will read it. You will read it. Um, uh, I love the story of Susanna Wesley, uh, who is uh, John and Charles Wesley's um, uh, mum. She had eleven children, uh, and that's all. I, I often say four kids is a lot of kids, but 11 kids is really a lot of kids. Uh, and um, she used to do this thing every day. Um, her, like her house was chaos, right? Kids everywhere, chaos. It was just crazy. Uh, but she would do this thing every day where she would sit down in a chair in her dining room and she would take her apron and she would put it over her head like this. Um, and she would put her Bible in and she would read um, her Bible. She couldn't see the chaos that was going on at, at, outside there. Uh, she would read her Bible in that little tent of an apron that she had made for herself because she valued it. And she knew that there would be loads of chaos. Um, as, soon as, as soon as the apron came down again, she'd have a whole bunch of work to do to, to um, and crazy everything. But uh, she valued her time of the Lord. And so she went, you know what? No matter what the crazy is going on around me, I'm going to prioritize that. And I raise this not to guilt you, friends. I think so often in 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 sermons we we get to the point like though, have you been reading your Bible recently? Kind of bit in the sermon, and we all go, No, I haven't. I haven't got a good Bible reading practice. I'm, I, I I come to church as a, uh, as a kind of blow off the dust from the last week. Um, uh, guilt as a strategy for helping you do the right thing is never going to work, is it? It doesn't work. It doesn't really produce lasting change. The only uh, um, That's not going to work. Now, the path uh, uh, of this story 
is to give you a story of disgust, actually. Um, when individuals, when churches, when societies forget the word of the Lord, all manner of evil becomes thinkable. All manner of evil becomes thinkable. Up becomes down, down becomes up. We, co we come to call evil good and good evil when we forget the word of the Lord. Friends, uh, let's do question time today. We're just going to spend a bit of time trying to learn from some bright spots among us. Uh, some of you do have anger reading habits. Um, you've figured out strategies that work for you uh, in your particular season, and I'd love to hear them, okay? Um, you know, because that's going to be helpful for all of us. So if you're if you're in that, just kind of, it's not a braggy thing. Um, uh, we're just a bunch of us need help, and so we're going to share uh, our helps. Okay, uh, Josiah has an encounter with the God of the Bible. Even though he'd been walking in the ways of the Lord somehow uh, since he was eight, uh, since before he was eight, um, so he he's now had an encounter with the God of the Bible, and so we read in verse eleven. When the king heard the word of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Um, imagine, they, they, people tear their robes all the time in the Bible, and so we kind of go, oh, it's no big deal. It's a really big deal. Imagine how desperate, how sad you'd have to be to tear your clothes right now. He understands that the nation that he leads is on a collision course with the true and living God. He, um, he sends his secretaries uh, to go meet with a prophetess named Haldar um, to find out if there's anything, anything that can be done um, about this. And uh, Haldar essentially says, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you're clearly uh, walking with the Lord King, but your people are a mess. They're as idolatrous as ever. Um, <laughs> hang on. And you can imagine... Uh, uh, so I'm going, wait, hang on. No, no, no. I, I've been cutting down since I was eight. Uh, I'm now 36. I've been cutting down the Asherah poles. I've been stopping the Baal worship. I've been stopping the Molech worship. How could they be as idolatrous as ever? Um, yeah, he might have. He might have been doing that. But remember, worshipping the things of made of stone and wood only makes sense when you first worship deeper idols. Um, power, approval, comfort, control. We talked about these earlier this year. You go back and uh, watch the talks from that, that campaign. Uh, and, and, and there's no way for Josiah's reforms to dislodge, dislodge those idols from the hearts of the people. He can't do it. I can't do it for you. Um, the, the best news Josiah gets from the prophetess is, listen, you're going to die before this destruction takes hold you'll be spared from seeing the worst of it. But Josiah really wants to fix this. He really doesn't want this to, to happen. He really wants to have a crack at, at, at fixing the people of, uh, of uh, Judah. And so, um, uh, so he gathers the elders of Jerusalem in 2 Kings 23 verse 1. Um, uh, and then we read verse 2. He went up to the temple of the Lord to the, with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow up, uh, to, to follow the Lord, to keep his his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the same thing. Uh, we really mean it this time. We're really going to do it this time. We're going to make another covenant. We're really going to try to get this done. Uh, we have this festival. Um, in a week and a half's time where we all make resolutions. Um, how does that ever go for you? Ever, ever, ever. It never works, does it? Willpower is not going to get you into the kingdom of God. Willpower alone is not going to help you change your habits so that you love the Lord, so that you would be like the, the tree planted by streams of living water. You, can't, you can try and quit something by pure willpower but for a while, but if it isn't met with a change in what you love, you won't manage it. You won't manage it. 
and it doesn't for the people that day. They all said, yeah, 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 we're going to do it this time. And then you read the words of uh, the prophet Jeremiah, who was writing at the same time as all this was going on, and he said, no, that's, that was just a thing they said. That was just a thing they said. It didn't go beyond their mouths and into their hearts. Uh, it, there is no chapter 26 of the book of two kings. And the reason for that is that the people continued in their idolatrous, and idolatrous ways. They continued worshipping false gods. And so the destruction that the prophetess Halda predicted came true. The people went off into exile. They were carried there by the, uh, overthrown by the Babylonians. We do with um, Josiah's story. Friends, it's very clear that even the best king that Judah ever had couldn't fix the people because he couldn't change their hearts. What we need, what all of us need more than anything else, is a king who's able to change our hearts, to change what we love who can come both as the king to cast out idols and the God who displaces our loves. Because that's the only way that our loves ever change is if they're displaced. Um, I, I often say that if you want to, the fastest way to empty a bathtub is not to pull the plug out. What you have to do is you get a hippo and you put the hippo in the bathtub and you really shove it down in there and there won't be any water left in the bath. Jesus is the hippo that displaces our loves. He displaces the things that we thought that our life should be about. He, 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 he says those, those things that you are chasing after, they promise such a big game, but they never deliver. They never deliver. You can chase levelling up in the public service. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And just if I can just get to the SES band, then I'll be able to make some real change. Then people will remember my name. And they won't. And you can't. That's not to say it's not good work. It's good work. It's important work. But if you make it ultimate, it doesn't matter how intricately, how carefully you worship that God, he will never deliver what you want. What you need is a God who says, I know you, I know you to the bottom, and I love you, and I will remember your name. That you are connected to the genealogy of mine, because it keeps on going. And if I take a thousand years, if I take 10,000 years to come, I will call your name and I will lift you up out of the dust. And you will stand with me in the company of my people where I know every single one of their names and I love them in intimately forevermore. Let me pray. Gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, uh, we are sorry for the times when we have tried to willpower our way into your good, good books. Father, we recognise that what we need is far deeper than anything we can conjure up from ourselves. Father, would you melt us? Would you change our hearts so that we love you more and love the stuff that we thought would give us life but doesn't seem to be less and less? Would you make that ugly for us and demonstrate Jesus as beautiful? Thank you that he came. He came at Christmas to displace our loves and to give us new hearts. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to do that washing and renewing work in us. We ask it 
for Jesus' sake and in his strong name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have um, time for questions.